Welcome to question number five from the 2023 AP Statistics FRQ exam. In this video, we're going to fully explain the answers and go over it in as much detail as possible. All right, at first look at this uh, problem, um, you know, multiple parts of this problem. It's got a lot to it. Some are a little bit more difficult than others, but I think once we walk through it, hopefully you'll find it not too bad and hopefully you scored well on it. Wildlife biologists are interested in the health of tule elk, a species of deer found in California. An important measurement of a tule elk health is their weight. The weight of tule elk is difficult to measure in the wild. I mean, what are you going to do? Trap them, somehow get them onto a scale to stand still? Like, not going to happen. However, chest circumference, which is believed to be related to the weight of a tule elk, can easily be measured from a safe distance using a harmless laser. So they shoot some kind of laser beam at these elk and it measures their chest circumference. Hopefully it doesn't hurt them. But anyway, all right, it does say safely. A study was done to investigate whether chest circumference in centimeters could be used to accurately estimate the weight in kilograms of the male tule elk. For the study, wildlife biologists captured 30 male tule elk, measured their chest circumference and their weight, and then released the elk. So they know that they can't measure all of the elk out there, but they were able to get 30 of them. They measured their chest circumference and they were able to measure their weight for 30 of them. Any more than 30 was just going to be too difficult. And from this, they created the following scatter plot. All right, there it is. Pretty simple. Hopefully, you got a lot to say about it because that's exactly what part A wants you to do. Describe the relationship between chest circumference and weight of male tule elk in context. So, first thing I noticed that the relationship between chest circumference and weight of these 30 male tule elk is positive, linear, and very strong. So, looking at it, it's clearly obvious that it's positive. Chest circumference goes up. Weight goes up. It's linear. It looks kind of like a line. It's not perfect, but I, don't, I definitely don't see a giant curve. And again, those points are kind of tightly forming that line, so I said very strong. But keep in mind the beginning. Some kids will just start, they'll just say, it is positive linear and very strong. Don't start off with a pronoun that you haven't defined yet. So start off with what you're talking about, the relationship between chest circumference and weight of male tole elk, which is literally me just copying the words from the question. But it's important that you start off like that instead of just jumping into a pronoun. All right, then I added the last thing, and that is that we want to make sure that we give some type of context here. So it appears that there is a tendency that as the chest circumference in centimeters of a male tule elk increases, so does the weight in kilograms of a male tule elk. So that's just kind of my general statement there that I see. Now, that's what we mean by positive, but linear, we see that it's increasing at a constant rate. So not only is it increasing, but it's increasing at that constant rate as well. All right, moving on to part B. Here, they say the following is the equation of the least squares regression line relating chest circumference and weight for male tule elk. So you don't have to find the line. They did it for you. The predicted weight equals negative 350.3 plus 3.7455 times the chest circumference. Now, part B says one of the male tule elk had a chest circumference of 145.9 centimeters and 204.3 kilograms. Use the equation of the least squares regression line to calculate the predicted weight for this male tule elk. Well, that's easy. Remember, all we need to do is find the chest circumference and plug it in. The chest circumference of this elk was in centimeters, 145.9. So I simply plug that into my formula to get the predicted weight. So using a calculator, I'm going to show you the work for this real quick. Um, not that I need to. It's pretty easy work here. Not that it's any advanced calculus. Negative 350.3 plus 3.7455. And then multiply by that 145.9. And that is oh, 0.9. Sorry for the typo there. And that's how I got the 196.168 kilograms. Not too difficult there. All right, part two of question B says to calculate the residual for this male tule elk. So the residual is a pretty simple formula as well. The residual is just the actual weight of the, the actual y value. So that's the actual weight of the elk minus the predicted. So it's just the difference between what the elk actually weighed and what we predicted. So we already know the actual weight is the 204.3. And all we have to do is subtract from that what we got for the predicted, the 196.168. And we got a residual value of 8.132. So the actual elk weighed 8.132 kilograms more than we predicted. Or you could say our prediction was an underestimate for that particular elk. All right, so part A and part B were actually pretty easy. So if you're on a way to getting at least half credit on this problem. All right, then they bring up, hey, let's interpret the slope. It's a very common question when you're working with least squares regression lines to interpret the slope. So the first thing I did was identify the slope. 
The negative 350.3 is the y-intercept. That's the A value. And right there is my B value. The slope is the 3.7455. So then I just simply identified it. Now I have to interpret it in context. As the chest circumference of a male Tully elk increases by one centimeter, the predicted weight of the male Tully elk increases by 3.7455 kilograms. All right, making sure that you understand how I got this. So the most important thing is that anytime I have a slope, I put it over one. And I think back to old school algebra, change of y on top divided by change of x on the bottom. That's slope. And in this problem, x is the um, chest circumference in centimeters, and the y is the kilograms of weight. So I know that for every one centimeter that the elk increases in chest circumference, we predict the weight to go up by 3.7455 kilograms. The other key thing we look for when we're grading this is that you use the word predicted. Make sure no one's saying that this is guaranteed to happen. So we don't want to say if, if an elk does increase its chest by one centimeter, maybe then bench presses or something, right? Then uh, it's going to guarantee to have a weight increase of 3.7455 kilograms. It's not a guarantee at all. It's just a predicted. Other ways you could say it is on average, a male Tully elk will increase by 3.745 kilograms for every one centimeters of its chest circumference increases. So you could also talk about it that way as well. A couple different ways you can interpret this, but um, got to have a couple of the key details there. So get another fairly easy question. All right, then comes the hard stuff. Now, this is unit nine, which is where a lot of teachers don't get to or they rush through. And this kind of question can be difficult. But if you use a little bit of common sense here, they actually give you everything you really need. So here's the question. The sambar, another species of deer, is similar in size to the tule elk. The slope of the population regression line relating chest, chest circumference and weight for all male sambars is 4.5 kilograms per centimeter. What I found interesting is that they somehow, I would think it would be pretty hard to know this, but they say they do, they know the slope of the population. That means that if you, you know, they must have looked at every single sandbar out there, made a regression line, and because they looked at all of them, they were able to get the population slope, which is 4.5. It's crazy that they know that, but they claim they do. That means for sandbar elk, for every one centimeter that their chest gets bigger, they're, they they don't it's not predicted they will because it's from the population um, have 4.5 kilograms more in their weight so here's where we, here's the rub here is where we get to our question a wildlife biologist wants to determine whether the slope of the population regression line for male tule elk is different than that for male sandbars now we don't know the population slope for tule elk all we know is our sample slope of once again 3.7455 that was just our sample slope from 30 elk that doesn't mean that that's what's true for the population but they want us to figure out if we were to think about what could be true for the population could it be different than that of the male sandbars so that's where they give the null hypothesis is that our true slope that's this greek letter beta that's the that's the population slope little lowercase english b is the sample slope Beta is the population slope. So the null would be that, no, the slope for sandbars is the exact same as the slope for tule elk, 4.5. And then the question that this researcher is trying to figure out is, is it different? Is the true population slope for tule elk different than sandbars? And that's why we see an alternative of not equal to 4.5. All right, now the test statistic was calculated to be 3.408. Now, assume all conditions for inference were met, which is awesome because the conditions for inference for slope are kind of difficult and not fun. You need, you need a ton more information to actually check them. So good news, we don't have to check them. Now, all they want us to do is interpret the p-value. So a couple kind of quick comments here. Most kids that really didn't understand this unit or didn't get to it are going to panic and not know what to do. But listen, you guys should know that a test statistic of 3.408 is pretty high. So usually when you have a high test statistic, you're going to have a very low p-value, which is going to cause you to reject the null. So even if you had no idea how to actually get the p-value, just make one up and you could even make up a low value. Now listen, you might not get this part 100% right, but you might get it partially correct. All right, now how do we actually get the correct p-value? So let me walk you through it. First, we do need to know the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom when you're working slope is sample size minus two because there's two variables when you're working with slope. So that's how we got 28 degrees of freedom. 
Now, what is a p-value? It is the probability of another sample slope being more extreme than R. So it would literally be a sample slope B being anything more extreme than R's. Again, R slope was 3.7455. We're trying to find the probability that any other sample of 30 elk comes back with a slope more than that. And that would correspond to a T-score more than 3.408. Again, we don't have to calculate the test statistic. They gave it to us. So I don't have to do any work to figure that out. Now, all I'm going to do now to actually get the p-values, I'm going to go to uh, TCDF here. TCDF is where you're going to go to get p-values when you're working with t-scores. And we're going to start at that value of 3.408. And we're going to go to 99. That's acting like our infinity, really, really high. And we need 28 degrees of freedom. That's what you need there. Again, once again, 30 elk in our sample minus 2 for 28 degrees of freedom. And we're going to go ahead and hit enter here, and I got 0 0.0010000. However, look at that alternative. The alternative is not equal to. That means this is a two-tailed test. So in any two-tailed test, when your alternative is not equal to, you do have to double your p-value to get 0 0.002. Now, the good news is it's still low. So we're going to multiply that p-value by 2, and we get 0 0.002. So there's my p-value. Very, very unlikely for our slope to be 3.7455 or higher. But again, a lot of kids might panic on this problem, not quite sure, know what to do. But I would hope that you would recognize with a test statistic of 3.408, that's going to typically produce a very low p-value. All right, one final part to this question. It's like the never-ending question here. All right, part um, two of D. So at the significance level of alpha equals 0.05, what conclusion should the wildlife biologist make regarding the slope of the population regression line for male Thule elk? All right, so again, you, to understand how to write this conclusion, you have to really understand the question. So go back and read it again if you have the time. They want to determine if the population slope for male Thule elk is different than the 4.5 that's true for sandbars. Well, with a low p-value of 0.02, which is clearly less than 0.05, I will reject the null hypothesis and agree with the alternative. Now, here comes the context. There is statistically significant evidence that the slope of the population regression line for male to the elk is not equal to 4.5. Again, I'm rejecting the null that it is 4.5. I'm going with the alternative. So I truly believe in my heart that it's not 4.5 for male to the elk. What is it? Honestly, I don't know. My sample was 3.7455, but it's, again, not that. So, therefore, it is safe to conclude that the slope of the population regression line for male Thule elk is different than the slope of the population regression line for male sandbars. Okay, so that's what the researcher was trying to figure out, was, hey, 4.5 was the population regression slope for male sandbars. Is the elk, for is the Thule elk different than that? And, yes, that's what our conclusion would be. We feel that we do have statistically enough significant evidence to conclude that I don't know exactly what it is, but it's not 4.5. All right, that's it for this question. Kind of a difficult one towards the end, but honestly, parts A, B, and C, I think were quite easy. So hopefully you can at least get two or three points on this question. Maybe even all four if you truly have a good a grasp of slope regression. All right, that's it. Now, there is one more thing I want to add to this question, and I might be wrong on this, but I also might be right. What surprised me was that the test statistic was positive 3.48, 3.408. I would assume that that should be negative. Again, why? Because a test statistic is usually found by taking what your statistic was, which in this case is 3.7455, that was my sample slope, and subtracting the null, which is what we were believing to be 4.5. Now that's, and then again, dividing by the standard error of the test statistic as well, which we don't know and don't worry about it right now. But the point is, is when you take the 3.7455, our sample statistic, and subtract the null, 4.5, that would produce a negative. So again, I didn't make this test question up. I, again, I could be wrong here, and maybe somebody will comment as to why. But I believe that this should have been negative. Now, the good news is it's not going to change your p-value, because if you look below negative 3.408, you should get the exact same p-value as opposed to looking above positive 3.408. But anyway, just thought I would note that. Kind of, I kind of thought that was a little bit strange, and maybe if you were really doing a deep dive in this problem, you thought the same. But all right, that's it. See you later.